everybody, or good morning, wherever you are <laughs> listening to this. I want to welcome you to church and welcome all the house churches and family groups and wherever you might be watching this lesson. Um, excited about today's lesson. We're going to do one of my favorite studies. Um, <clears throat> and the title of the lesson is The Spiritual Journey, which, you know, there's a lot of stuff you could talk about in the spiritual journey, but there's one particular part about the spiritual journey that uh, when we're on that can be really intense. And I want to talk about that. Some like intense moments when we're in our spiritual journey. You know, we, we, we know that um, uh, really the whole Christian life is a spiritual journey, right? I love this quote. I've shared it many times. We're not humans having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. And one of the things that I think is really exciting about uh, our world right now is people are becoming a lot more aware about spirituality and, and really kind of put more of a focus on that than just on being religious or religion. Uh, the question is becoming much more is, are you spiritual rather than what church do you go to? And I think that's a great trend. That's a great shift in our world is really about being spiritual or being spirit led hearing god's voice and i think it's really important right now because our world is just kind of going crazy right now and and we need so much to be able as christians especially to be able to hear god's voice right um so i actually you know love talking about the christian life as a journey a spiritual journey and because it's a journey we're all on. I mean, usually when, you know, when somebody says spiritual journey, it's you ask them about their kids and they say, oh, my son's not going to church or my daughter's not going to church. She's on her spiritual journey. But the truth is we're all on our spiritual journey, all of us. And we all go through ups and downs. We all go through good times and tough times and, and you know, times that are great. And there's times that are really hard. And, and I want to talk about that today. Sometimes when we get those moments of desperation or difficulty, um, I I, uh, I was actually uh, working with Chat GPT AI basically, and I was curious what AI would say about the spiritual journey because I've been actually pretty amazed at AI's understanding. I think I shared in a previous lesson. I asked AI for a definition of the kingdom of God, and it was an outstanding definition. But so I asked AI to write me a poem about the spiritual journey. And so here's here's the poem that it wrote me. Upon the path of life we tread, a journey's vast where spirits spread. Through valleys deep and mountains high, we walk, we stumble, we seek the sky. In each step a quest unfurls, a voyage of the soul through the worlds, with shadows lurking, doubts untamed, yet in the heart a fire aflamed inflamed challenges rise like stormy seas testing our faith bending our knees yet through the tempest light still gleams guiding us on with hopeful dreams for in this journey hand in hand we're led by grace by unseen hand through trials heavy burdens borne we find our strength in early morn in moments dark when hope seems lost a whisper comes a sacred frost Revealing truths we cannot see, God's faithfulness, our sanctuary. In, in victories won, in battles fought, in lessons learned, in wisdom sought, we glimpse the truth of love's embrace and feel the warmth of divine grace. So onward we march with hearts aflame, knowing we're never quite the same. For in this journey we come to see the depth of God's fidelity. That was written by AI. I mean, I was like, whoa, that's better than I could have written for sure. But it's pretty amazing. You know, uh, I, I thought this poem was really great in describing the journey that we're on. I mean, it's a journey we're all on, right? It's a journey we all get, we all understand. And today I want to talk about... Um, you know, one person's particular journey. I want to read the scripture because we all know it so well. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. 
I will be found by you. And, you know, it's kind of the whole journey is, is learning to turn to God whenever we hit a wall or go through a desert or go through a dark night of the soul or go through a challenging time that we learn to turn to God and find him and be with God and he'll help us on the journey. And so we're going to, we're going to read a classic scene in the spiritual journey. This is the story of Elijah and and what he goes through. I can't remember if we've actually studied this out uh, before, but it, you know, it doesn't matter even if we did, there's always so much more to learn. And recently, this has been especially impacting to me. So um, now you remember Elisha, right? He was, we find him in First Kings, and he's one of God's prophet, prophets, and he's, he's a feisty guy, he's a, he's a troublemaker. You know, he confronted idolatry in Israel. He challenged the king and the queen, her life, his life. Um, he took on all the prophets of Baal. I mean, it was at a time, it was a really dark time in Israel when all of God's people, when a lot of God's people were turning to false idols and to false gods. And even the king and queen were tearing down altars to God, to Yahweh God, and putting up altars to Baal, right? And Elijah comes and his name means Yahweh is my God. And I mean, that alone is just his, even his name challenges the system. And, and so he comes in and he's preaching Yahweh and he's preaching against false worship and false idols and false gods. He called a drought in the land. And, you know, and when you're living off your, what you grow outside and, and you're living off rain, a drought is huge. He was fed by ravens, and um, there's a classic story where he gives the widow this oil jar that never runs out. The, the widow's son dies. He raises him from the dead. I mean, how awesome is that? And probably the story we know him for the best is when he challenged the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And, and you know, and that whole scene, remember all the prophets were trying to see who could light a fire. And, and that story is significant for a lot of reasons. One is Elijah calls down lightning from heaven. And Baal is supposedly the god of lightning. In fact, if you ever see statues of Baal, he's almost always holding a lightning, uh, a lightning rod or a, a, a bolt of lightning. And he's the god uh, that controls the weather. He's also the god of storms and rains. And Elijah calls a drought. So kind of really challenging directly Baal, right? His power, his authority. And then, of course, Li uh, Elijah calls down fire from heaven or a bolt of lightning that comes down and lights up everything. And he also ended the drought. You know, he called for the drought to end, and it ended. And, I mean, just victory after victory after victory. I mean, I think it would have been really a lot of fun to be Elijah, you know, to be the one carrying out miracles. You know, we, you, we love to see miracles, right? And, and some of us, we are the miracle. You know, when God changed our lives, he changed our marriages, he changed our characters. And a lot of us have seen a lot of miracles. We've seen people change, transformed. We've seen incredible things. I've seen so many miracles. I've seen, I, I remember I met this one guy and he was very open. We started studying the Bible. He just, he said he wanted to become a Christian. This guy was addicted to cocaine. He was doing cocaine almost daily, like four or five days a week. He had a huge habit. I can't even remember how much he was spending. It's like a couple hundred dollars a day habit. And he studied the Bible. And this was, I just got to say, it was before CR. So I didn't know. I really, I was kind of ignorant, but I was faithful. And we stayed the Bible for three days and he got baptized. And you know what? He has been clean and healthy ever since. I mean, he never touched drugs again. He's actually an evangelist leading a church now. And I mean, talk about a miracle, just complete change. I remember there was a couple that that came to church and and they were they actually were gonna go Monday to see their lawyers to get filed for divorce and do a no contest uh, divorce. And I said, can, can you just hold off? Can you just postpone it? Let's get together and talk. And they both ended up studying the Bible. They reconciled. They had an awesome marriage. 
And they were like one of our family's favorite families to hang out with. And it was just a complete miracle story. And I've seen so many like that. I met a guy when I was door knocking in the hood and and in, in the barrio, and he was a he was a boxer who was a muscle man for a drug cart group. A guys, a bunch of guys selling drugs. I actually knocked on the door. The door swung open, and there was a bunch of guys standing around a table cutting cocaine. And they're like, "What do you want? Get out of here!" You know. And I said, "I'm inviting people to the church." And they were like, "Get out of here!" And I so I left. And when I was walking away, this guy comes running out. And his I remember his name was Ruben. He was a great guy. And he was like, dude, I want to go to church, you know. And so we studied the Bible. And that's when I found out that he was their muscle. He was a boxer, but he used to hurt people for them that didn't pay up their bills, you know, didn't pay the, the drug dealers. And he became a Christian. And he used to box every Friday night in downtown San Diego. And so all the brothers would go on Friday night. We would watch him box. We would cheer him. He was a terrible boxer. He got beat up all the time. But man, he had the best cheering squad and all the all the brothers would be cheering him on. And we even had our men's day there at the boxing rink and we had the podium in the middle of the boxing ring. It was a great, great, I mean, just miracles, you know, just great stories, incredible things. And I know we all have them and, and there's so many and I've seen so many miracles. So Elijah was like the miracle man. He'd done so many great things. But then we read in Elijah, about Elijah in 1 Kings 19, we read, now Ahab told Jezebel, and these are the king and queen, everything, Ahab was a prophet, a false prophet king, and he says, now he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Elijah, remember, he killed the false prophets. He killed the Baal, the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent a messenger, that's the queen, to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. So all these things have happened, and you know, and the, the big victory on Mount Carmel against the prophets of Baal, he kills them all and just gets wipes them out. And he's this incredible, courageous uh, warrior for God. And then she says, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. And she said, "Be it." He, I mean, she even kind of made an oath. She said, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. I mean, it's one thing to say I'm going to kill him, but to say I'm going to kill him in the next 24 hours, that's like, Dang, that's like now, right? This is going to happen now. So now you got to remember, Elijah has had his life threatened many times. He's faced a lot of challenges. I mean, he took on all the prophets of Baal. I mean, everything was on the line. But something happened this time. And it says in verse 3, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush and sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. This is, this is like I said, it's one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. This is a very powerful thing that happens. First of all, Elijah was afraid. It's like, wait, what? I mean, after everything he'd been through and all the victories and great things that happened, now he's afraid? But the truth is, we know that that happens to us, right? I mean, we can all see miracles. We can all experience miracles and still lose faith. I mean, I think about like when, 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 um, when Mary came to Jesus and they, his whole family, they all thought he was out of his mind. I'm like, wait a second, Mary spoke to an angel. An angel told her that Jesus was the Messiah, that he would save his people. So what happened? All these years later, she kind of forgot. And, and, and I thought, well, you know, that happens, right? When we see miracles, later on, we kind of think, did that really happen? Or was it this, or was it that, or was I just lucky, or, or what was that, you know? And, and, and we can doubt, 
right? And then when we doubt, you know what comes right behind that? Fear. Fear. Even though God had saved him so many times, now he's afraid for his life. Now he's on the run. And, and you know, you can think, well, okay, we, we, we all go through that, right? And I mean, I've said it many times. What is the most frequent command in the Bible? Do not fear. Don't be afraid. And what does he always say right after that? I will be with you. I mean, that, that command, I counted, I, I said one time in a sermon 360 times because I read that somewhere. I couldn't find 360, but I did find about 270 times where God says, don't be afraid. And, and many of those, the very next line is, I will be with you. Am I not with you? I will be with you. For I am here, you know, I mean, we, a lot of us memorize and still want to encourage you if you haven't memorized Psalm 23 and recite it daily. You know, uh, even though I walk through the valley of shadow, I fear no evil for you are with me. And that's key, knowing God is with us. But something happened to, to Elijah here. And, and, and by the things that he says, so what does he do? He, he leaves his sermon. He goes into the wilderness. He finds this broom bush, which is a big tree, basically. It's, it, well, it's really a low, a, a low sitting tree, but it's, they're really big. So they're great for shade. And they're actually a great place to hide too. And he sat down under it and he prayed that he might die. It's like, wait a second. He's running because he's afraid of being killed, but then he's praying that he might die. What, what's going on here? And I've thought about this, you know, Elijah wasn't, he wasn't angry. In fact, I, I suspect that he was really just feeling guilty and feeling bad that he was even afraid. He knew that he shouldn't be afraid, but he was afraid. He knew that he should have more faith. I mean, he raised somebody from the dead. I mean, that's, uh, what bigger thing can you do? But I think he was ashamed. I think he was disappointed in himself. I think he felt bad. How do I think, why do I think that? Because, well, two things. He said, one, I've had enough. And he said, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. He was feeling bad about himself. He was feeling like, I'm blowing it. I am blowing it. And, but he was very, very tired. He was exhausted. He tells, he, he, he prays to God. He says, I've had enough. You know that feeling when you feel like I'm done. I'm out of here. I've had enough. I, I can't take any more of this. I'm, I'm done. I've had it. I've had it. No more. No mas. We all know that feeling. And sometimes we feel that way spiritually. Can't do any more. Can't go any more. This is it. This is, this is as far as I go. And that's how he was feeling. And that's what, what happens when we're, when we're really tired or we're exhausted or we're burned out. We get there. Even the best of us. We get to where we're just like, no more. Not, not going to call anybody back. Not going to talk to anybody else. Not going to open up, not going to share, not going to, you know, don't even want to go to church, don't want to go to my Bible talk, don't want to, you know, I mean, we all get there sometimes, and that's where he was at, and he felt bad about it, it wasn't like he was just being stubborn and prideful, he felt guilty, he said, I know better than anybody else, what the heck's wrong with me, after all I've seen and experienced, why am I lacking faith, why am I afraid, but it's what he felt. And the Lord, he said, Lord, he said, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. And I think, I think this really kind of shows where he's at. Because when we're deeply discouraged, when we feel bad, we just want to go to sleep. We just want to go take a nap. We just want to sleep it off. Now, in the world, they want to check out, right? Everybody wants to check out. A Christian will go take a nap, <laughs> go to sleep, a godly person. A non-godly person, they'll go get high. They'll go get drunk. They'll go find some pleasure to take their mind off their pain, off their struggle, off their suffering. But Christians don't do all that garbage. 
what do we do? Or a godly person he just lays down and take a nap. And that's kind of the natural response of depression, of discouragement. I think Elijah was just deeply discouraged. He had no more inspiration. He had no more fight in him. He had no more drive. I know I've been there before. I've, I've had, I remember a few years back, I got really hurt in a situation. And, and, and somebody who I felt really, like really stabbed me in the back. And I was just in shock. I just, I couldn't believe it. And I remember even some brothers told me, bro, you need to fight back, man. You need to clear your name. You need to call out that brother. You need to expose him. And I, I remember saying, I got no fight in me, bro. If that's what he wants to do to me, let him do it. If he wants to talk trash, let him talk trash. I'm not going to fight. I just had no fight. I was exhausted. We had been going through a lot, and we had some really intense situations in my family. One of my best friends just died. One of our other best friends was in the hospital fighting for her life. I mean, emotion. We were just getting bombarded. And all this stuff was happening, and there was a situation with within our family that we literally had to call the police to get help because this person was out of control and, da and endangering our family. And I was just done. And then this brother said some stuff and did some stuff that was really hurtful. And, and everybody was like, take them on. You got to challenge it. You got to clear that up. And I was just like, I'm done. I, I, I got no more. I got no fight in me. We all get there sometimes. We all hit walls. We all hit valleys or deserts where we're just challenged. And, and this is part of the journey. This is part of the journey, of the spiritual journey. It's also an important part. When, when, when we find ourselves struggling, it's actually not all bad. It's actually can be really good because it can lead us to really much deeper, richer, better relationship with God. But this is where Elijah was at the moment. And now what I want to turn to is the way God responds. It says in the very next verse, all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. I think this is one of the most tender scenes in the whole Bible. So God sends his angel, the angel of the Lord, and he comes and he wakes up Elijah. And he says, get up and eat. And Elijah gets up, you know, I mean, he's supposed to be by himself out in the wilderness. And he looks around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. I think this is so incredibly cool. I think this is so special that God, he doesn't come and say, dude, what are you doing? He doesn't come and say, look, you lazy bum, get up. He doesn't come and say, how could you lack faith, you, you, you loser, after all the miracles you've seen? I mean, he could have easily just scolded him, right? And Elijah deserved it, but he didn't. The angel came, woke him up, and he made him some, at least in my version of scripture, he made him fresh tortillas. He made him fresh flour tortillas. He said, well, it doesn't say tortillas. Well, have you ever seen Middle Eastern bread? Those are tortillas. <laughs> and basically, you know, there's, there's, just no, there's nothing like fresh flour tortillas. Probably most of you never had them like that, but if you ever find a place where they make them fresh where some ladies there making them and in old town san diego all the restaurants have some lady there making fresh flour tortillas oh man they're good god shows up and he cooks some lunch he makes them some fresh tortillas gives them a jar of water i bet it was cold water that was just pure and clean and he ate and he drank and then he lay down again i mean this is how exhausted elijah is even after a blessing like that, he's not like, all right, ready to go. He lays back down and he goes to sleep again. He was wiped out. And God just came and took care of him. He just took care of him. This is our God. He just wants to take care of you. He wants to meet your needs. 
Nobody meets needs like God. I mean, we have some wonderful people in the church that are really good about meeting each other's needs. And that's the way the church should be. But the one who best meets our needs is always God. And then it says, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by the food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night. I love this. The, you know, the angel comes back again. And I don't know if, I mean, he may not even been there when Elijah woke up and saw the bread and the water. Of course, you know, Elijah, I don't know what he was thinking it was. But, but the angel comes back and he says, get up and eat. And this is a really important sentence. He says, the journey is too much for you. The fact is, sometimes our journey does reach that point where it's just too much. Sometimes we overdo it. Sometimes we do too much. And we need to recognize that. And this is what the angel Lord was telling him. Look, dude, right now, you just need to rest. You just need to be with God. You need to get stronger. You need to get healthier. And that's okay, too. And that's good, even. I love that, that God recognizes when the journey is too much for us. He's so compassionate. He's so kind. He's so patient. And sometimes we just need to focus on God. And it doesn't mean you do nothing, because what did Elijah do? He traveled 40 days and 40 nights. That's over a month to get to Mount Horeb. And he went to the mountain of God. Why Mount Horeb? What's the big deal about Mount Horeb? Well, you know, Mount Horeb is the same mountain where Moses received the Ten Commandments, where Moses saw the burning bush, where Moses first connected with God, where all of this began, the people of Israel, the nation, the Holy Nation, all of this began at Mount Horeb. And so what does Elijah do? He goes back because that's where people, that's where Moses connected with God. So Elijah's turning to God. And he's going back to see God, the mountain of the Lord, which is important for us to, to learn from that, that when we're struggling, when we're going through a hard time, what do you do? Our instinct is buckle up or get mad or figure out something that we've done in the past or find a solution. But the first thing we should do is turn to God. That's the first thing. That's the most important thing is that we turn to God because God really is the one with the solutions and God can help us and God loves us and God cares about us. It's, it's more important even than calling up the brothers or the sisters. It's more important than going to the church. It's more important than going to our family. It's more important than, than coming up with our own solutions. What's most important, and this is the spiritual person what they do is you turn to God. God, give me some direction. Help me figure out what to do. And, and the great thing is God is a compassionate God. He just showed that. He didn't scold Elijah for his lack of faith. He actually fed him and took care of him. He nurtured him. He helped him out. So what does Elijah do in response? He goes to the mountain of the Lord to be with God. And there he goes into a cave and he spends a night. And then this incredible scene. And the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And I love this question because I don't think he was asking, I think it was a rhetorical question. I don't think he was asking because he didn't know. He knew exactly why Elijah was there. But he wanted Elijah to think about why am I here? Why am I here? Because God saves. Because God restores. Because God give strength to the weary because God is good. And sometimes we just got to stop and remember that. Sometimes we have to remember God is good. So I need to stop acting like I don't know him or that he won't help me or that he's too far away. I need to turn to him and rely on him. And, and you know, Elijah, he had a little bit of a pity party going. We see it in his response, right? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. 
He's like, man, I've, I've done, I've been faithful for years. I've given lots of missions money. I've given lots of contribution. I've, I've gone to a lot of meetings. I've been faithful to all the Bible talks and da, da, da. He says, the Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. He kind of had a poor me. I'm, I'm the only one doing what's right. I'm the one that's putting, you know, doing the right thing. And sometimes we get like that. We get kind of a little pity party. We become the victims of the world. Poor me, nobody believes in me, nobody's behind me, nobody helps me out, nobody cares. And almost always that's not true. But we go there emotionally. That's kind of a, we emotionally implode. But notice what God says. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. I mean, I love that scene. Imagine God saying, I'm going to pass by. I mean, whoa. <laughs> So Elijah goes out on the side of the mountain and he's standing there waiting for God to pass by. What in the world is that going to look like? The creator of the universe passing by the mouth of a cave. It says, then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. So God tells him, I want you to come out here and watch what's going to happen. And of course, you know, you got, you got the earthquake, you got the wind, you got the fire. But in each one of them, God was not in them. Usually when we think of God, we think of big things, right? And we see God in the big things. But a lot of times we don't see God in the little things. And it says literally that after the fire came a gentle whisper. I actually looked this up in the Hebrew. It actually in the Hebrew says a slice of silence, which it's kind of hard to understand. And what 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 some of the, the, the scholars think is it was just this it's another way you could even say that is the sound of silence. So God was not in the roar of the wind, the roar of the fire, the roar of the earthquake, but he was in the gentle sound of silence. In other words, He's always there, even when we don't hear him. Even when we don't think he's there, he is there. He is there with you right now. He's with you right now. And when you don't feel his presence, he is with you. And when you're struggling, he is with you. When you are happy and everything's going great, he is with you. We forget that sometimes. That's why we have to turn to the Lord when we're in trouble, when we're down and out, when we're going through a hard time, to remember he is with me. When I feel afraid, remember he is with me. When I feel discouraged or tired or angry or any of these things, to remember he is with me. He is in the sound of silence. He's right there. We live in troubled times, and we've talked a lot about it. Social challenges, race, gender, justice questions, political challenges. We're in an election year. Things are heating up. I don't know what's going to happen. Polarization, war. Truth is, things could get a lot worse. And, of course, churches always have challenges, needed changes, cultural changes, maturity, leadership style. We had a great meeting last week with the family group leaders. We talked about the changes we want to see in the church, organization, theology, culture, all that stuff. These are difficult times. How are we handling them? Jesus invites us. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Learn how to do this Christian life from Jesus. For I am gentle and humble in heart. We turn to Jesus. It's like turning to, like Elijah turning to God. He didn't send 
an angel to come and kick Elijah's butt. He sent an angel to love up on Elijah, to serve him, to feed him, to nurture him. Jesus says, I am gentle and humble in heart. You can count on Jesus being gracious and merciful, and you will find rest for your souls. When in this journey, sometimes we're running on empty, sometimes we break down, and we have to turn to Jesus. We have to have that as our conviction. I don't turn to TV, I don't turn even just to music, I don't turn to my friends, I don't certainly don't turn to alcohol or drugs. I don't turn to anger. I don't turn to frustration. I don't turn to being a victim. I turn to Jesus and I listen to him. And he says, for my yoke, what is a yoke? It's the burden of work, my job for us. It's easy and my burden is light. We have to, all we have to do is to remember to turn to the Lord, to remember to go to Mount Horeb, and remember, remember to turn to Jesus, and making sure that we are sufficiently connected. This is the life that he promises for us, a life of joy, of love, of peace, of patience, of kindness, of goodness, of faithfulness, of gentleness, self-control. What if I was selling a pill that would give you this? Wouldn't we all want that pill? I mean... Wouldn't we all buy that? We'd all be calling Doug saying, give me a prescription if there was a pill for this. There isn't a pill, but there is Jesus. There is God. And he helps with this, us with this. He helps us to find it, to have it, and to live it. Our Christian life can't look like this, where we're all just working, working, working for the Lord where we're all sacrificing ourselves and just suffering through it. That's not life to the full. That's not what Jesus had in mind. When we're tired, we need to rest. When we're running on empty, we need to refill and refuel. When we're feeling afraid, we need to turn to God and let him restore us. Christian life isn't meant to just bear it and get through it until you die and Hopefully go to heaven. The Christian life is to be enjoyed. A life of love, joy, peace, patience, all those things. As I've shared in the past, this is what I want my Christianity to look like. There's Michelle and I cranking away. This is what the Christian life is supposed to be like. It's not easy, but man, it's awesome. Remember always to turn to God. And even as we take communion, This is why Jesus died on a cross for us, so that our life could look like this and not like this. God wants us to have a great life, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you hope and a future. Just remember, turn to him. You will find me when you turn to me with all your heart. So with that, I leave you, and we can take communion and have great discussion groups. God bless you. God be with you. And buen camino.